developed and, and they're already delivered improvements to that. So they work even better together now. So there's a, an even more seamless sort of flow between those those two solutions. So from an agent's point of view, particularly that might be using StudyLink for admissions and Flywire for payments, the two just exchange data together better than they did before, making that an even easier process for the agents to manage. Hi, I'm Dirk Mulder, founder of The Koala News. I'm coming to you from Durham Country in Western Sydney. And g'day, I'm Rob Maliki. I'm the CEO of The Global Society, coming to you from Garrigal Land in Eastern Sydney. <laughs> and it's good to be back after a couple of couple of weeks of break. It sure has. You've been, you've been <laughs> on a break, mate. You've, uh, well, we've both been on a break. We've, we've actually had a couple of weeks off, haven't we? It has been. It's amazing to have a couple of weeks off at this time of year. It's great. So I was down at the Governor General's Scout Camp. First Ooh. time in 100 years that they've had scouts camping on the lawns of Government House down in Canberra, about 2,000 scouts and leaders, which was an absolute blast. And I've, for those of you watching on the video, you'll see it. I've kind of held on to the scouting experience. I haven't shaved in a few days because tonight at the scout hall, I'm running some exercises. So I'm keeping on my Bushman's beard in order to simulate an activity more realistically. What have you been up to, Dirk? I was going to say that'll complement the, the Kubra nicely, Rob. Absolutely, absolutely. For sure. Mate, unfortunately, a good friend of ours, Andrew Everett, passed away. So last week when we were due to record, I was actually on the road from Sydney to Brisbane to attend Andrew's funeral. Unfortunately, flights back and forth. The funeral took place just the day before Anzac Day and getting back to Sydney was not mm-hmm. impossible. So yeah, mate, was on the, took, a, took a couple of days out and it was quite cathartic, to be honest. I haven't, I haven't been in the car for that kind of longer drive for, for some time. So it was it was quite nice, obviously under terrible circumstances. but um, Very sad news, Andrew Everett, an absolute legend of international education in Australia. Tell us a little bit more about Andrew and, and about the service. Mate, well, look, I mean, from Andrew's point of view, yeah, Andrew, well, certainly from when I first became a director, that's when I, I met Andrew, and that would have been in 2008, I want to say. And I told Andrew this story just before, well, probably back in January. Andrew and I become quite close over the last couple of years, and we'd probably, you know, chat to each other once a week. But yeah, mate, I said to him, you know, I remember my first AUIDF meeting so well. He used to sit down at the end of the table, and Andrew, for those of you that don't know, came from the banking sector originally. So he was always wearing, or I always saw him in a, in a white shirt and some sort of banker's kind of tie, and it might have been a stripe or something similar. And he wouldn't say much in AUIDF meetings, but undoubtedly, once or twice in, in this meeting, you got a picture of the meeting because there's, what, 37 people sitting around a table. He would just go, no, we're not doing that. That's not right. That's not what we're about. We should be doing better than that. And he'd say it in a way with such authority that people would just sit up and listen. And and colleague directors, whether they be young pups in the room like myself or, you know, fellow GO eight members who had been around the around the block for, for a number of years. But inevitably everyone respected his opinion because it came from a place of integrity. He looked out for the sector's reputation. He was just someone who, again, when when he spoke, you listened. And I remembered saying to him and, and the story, this is where the story, I guess, diverges somewhat. A second AUIDF meeting that I ever attended, he did the same thing. He sat there and he spoke up and I went, oh, this guy, oof, I don't know. And then we had dinner that night. I remember that the meeting was at UTS and we had dinner at an Indian restaurant in Darling Harbour. And lo and behold, I think I was sitting next to someone and we'd already started having a glass of wine and, and Andrew came in and parked himself next to me. And I remember thinking in my head, oh gosh, this is going to be a long night. And I tell you what, we had we shared one glass of wine together, and we've we've been mates ever since. Again, the image that you have at the other end of the table of this somewhat at times long face that is very has this sense of authority behind it to the man who would do would give you the shirt off his back once you get to know him. It was just so different to, to my first experience. So, yeah, so on a personal level, very, very close to Andrew and and have been for a very, very long time. In terms of Andrew's past, mate, like I said, he started off as a banker, but ended up as a, in, in a, I guess, a more junior role or, or manager role at, at the University of Southern Queensland. He moved it across to the University of Queensland, where he was the international director for a significant amount of time. And then he ended up uh, moving over to Charles Darwin University to become the deputy vice chancellor and vice president of global strategy and advancement. And his portfolio included the Office of International Services and the Office of Marketing and Engagement. So he kind of, you know, in, in kind of weird way, in an aspirational way of most people who are in international, he kind of made it to the top of the totem pole. Yeah, someone without a PhD who became a Deputy Vice-Chancellor. And you know, it's the aspirations of, of, of a lot of people in the sector. Probably best known during that period, 
of bringing in the only flight of students into Australia during the COVID pandemic. So if you can imagine the negotiation the and the skills that that would have taken, amazing. Beyond that, Andrew contributed to almost every forum and or every sector forum that you could possibly imagine. He was on the board of the IAA, obviously the AUIDF. Uh, he chaired Universitas 21 and, and basically put up his hand for any sort of voluntary contribution that he could make to, to better the sector. So, mate, yeah, look, long story short, a great mate, a great mentor, a great colleague, and someone who I know I will dearly miss and a lot of people around the country will dearly miss. His service happened in Brisbane, as I mentioned last Wednesday, and he survived by his two beautiful daughters and his ex-wife. And his daughters both just spoke beautifully and was probably the highlight of the service. Yeah, he was a real tearjerker, and um, I know a lot of people tuned in who couldn't make it, uh, or tuned in online who couldn't make it to the the service itself. But yeah, mate, he's going to be missed, that's for sure. He will be missed, and you were poorer as an industry for, for his passing. Thanks for the update. Obviously, mm. really tough when, when the industry loses anybody, but obviously such a, a big presence will, yeah. will be sore, sorely missed. Maybe we move into some of the latest happenings of, of the last couple of weeks. It's been quite a bit going on. I might be focusing on a couple of issues, but Property Council has put out this very interesting report. So I first read about this in, in the Koala. This is a big one. Really good piece of research. Mate, I think it is, yeah. So the students, so underneath the umbrella of the Property Council, they've got a, lot, a number of subsections, and, and one of the subsections is the Student Accommodation Council. And so that this, this subsection put out a report that looked at international students and the rental market, probably turned on its head what a lot of the government sort of speak or narrative has been around uh, net overseas migration and particularly the student program contributing to housing affordability, housing supply, and generally the, the, the housing crunch that we're, that we're feeling at the moment. The headline of this is that only 4% of Australia's rental market is actually contributed by international students. So this takes a lot of the wind out of that narrative that international students are pushing up at rental prices. They're taking supply out of the market and it's, it is huge. So we, we wait and see now as to what the government says. There was a poll out last Tuesday, I want to say, which was covered. I, I saw it on Seven News, I, I want to say, but and I can't remember the exact name of the poll, but it was something like 48% of those polls or, or voters that have been polled would be more likely to vote for a government that wants to reduce net overseas migration. So that to me is the key figure in this whole dynamic. So long as, you know, Joe Public thinks that international students or net migration is contributing to this rental crisis, then that that polling figure will stay high. And if that polling figure stays high, the government will continue to push its policy on reducing net overseas migration. Interestingly enough, the group of eight yesterday, I want to say, put out an also report, uh, another report, which complements this Property Council report quite well in that they're saying that the housing affordability and the housing crunch that we're seeing at the moment was more brought on by structural differences and, and structural elements within the economy rather than international students as well. So we've now got two pieces of, of you know pretty solid research or hopefully pretty solid research that now nullifies that government view. So it'll be interesting to see over the next couple of weeks. Obviously, Minister O'Neill's been dealing uh, with some bushfires elsewhere, particularly the alleged bashing of a grandmother in Perth by a someone who wasn't wearing an ankle bracelet and arguably maybe should have possibly been in detention, but not. So there's a lot going on in the immigration portfolio at the moment, but certainly my eyes and, and I know a lot of eyes in the sector now are looking at what will the government's response to this be. But I think it's it's prudent on us all to keep talking about that message that this is an international student issue. So why are we, why are we punishing international students? Yeah, I mean, well, now we have unequivocal proof that they are contributing to the problem, just not very much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Not very much. Not very much at all. <laughs> not much at all. And, no. uh, you know, I, I did see it was picked up by news.com.au, but not actually picked up by, by Fairfax or, or any of the others, which is disappointing. You know, it's, it's once again when the mainstreams want to run a narrative and they're not yep. prepared to balance out the story they're trying to tell. With, yep. with you know balancing facts, then, then we have a problem in this country, and no, absolutely. I think that needs to be addressed. On the upside, the ABC picked it up quite a bit. I uh, ironically, I was in the car driving back from I think it was from Armadale back to back to Sydney, and literally every hour it was the it was the top news story. So it's good to see that it did, it did get some cut through. But like you say, I think yeah, some of those private broadsheets do need to start looking uh, a little bit a little bit broader afield at, at some of these issues. Yes, well and well and truly, and. Talking about myths, there was an article published in the Koala from Alan Olson, so absolute legend of the industry. And and once again, we've spoken about this before, but a coup to have Alan writing 
for, for the koala. Absolutely. And a, an excellent piece of work around this, this myth which continues to perpetuate that international students are somehow dragging down the standard inside Australian universities. Do you want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, absolutely. So Alan Consistency looks at data around success rates. That's conceptualised by those completing what they set out to study. And so this is the latest iteration. This is 2022 data, which is published in 23. The headline is, I guess, in universities, international students commencing bachelor degrees do better than their domestic colleagues. The numbers that sit behind it, 298,134 students commenced bachelor degrees in 41 Australian universities in 2022. 76% were domestic students and 24% were internationals. So roughly one in four. The 70,420 international students passed 85.8% of what they attempted and they outperformed the 227,714 domestic students who passed 84.1%. So they're, you know, 1.7% 1.7% above the domestic colleagues. Andrew Norton, who is obviously a very well-known commentator within education circles, commented on, on the Koala's Twitter feed around this one. And he said a lot of that had to do with the withdrawal or, or non-continuation of domestic students. And he's, he's right, but I would argue that this is apples with apples. So if international students pull out, they can pull out too. You know, they might want to go home. They might want to change courses. They might want to do other, other things. But this seems to be a fairly solid figure to say... Well, it certainly takes the heat out of that out of that myth that you were talking about that international students drag drag things down. And the anecdotal things that keep coming up from time to time where, you know, poor English or poor study group participation or, or those types of things. We're now seeing data that shows that international students do stick. And my and certainly from my experience or and my anecdotal experience, if I can put it that way, in the institutions that I've worked with, there's a real investment in working through the program that you've enrolled in. Fees are higher than domestic students. So there's a real stick there for international students and a real incentive to, to complete. So, and, and these, these numbers prove that. Yeah, and look, at it's, it's a very, very long time series that Alan has, has in, that, in that article and in the research that he's done, goes yep. all the way back to the early, early 2000s. And back in the early 2000s, it, it was literally the flip of, of where we are now. It so is, yeah. About, about two two percentage points difference, a little bit more two and a half percentage points difference in, yep. in success rates between domestic and international, with international on the lower side of that in 2001. Yep. A decade later, basically line ball, yep. and 10 years beyond that into 2022, suddenly international students are, are close to two percentage points up, which people might not think is very much. But when you look at the scale of what we're talking about here, we're talking about literally thousands of additional courses being passed by international students that are not being passed by domestic students. So it's one of those things that's interesting. I think there's a lot of human psychology in this is that maybe that narrative was entrenched in the early to mid 2000s. Okay. And funnily enough, you know, universities, places of research and evidence, but maybe some of that, um, some of that stigma hasn't, you know, been, been affected by that big swing yeah. Um, in the evidence over the last decade. No, you're right. And again, I think it's beholden on people in the sectors to talk this up. And yeah, we often talk about employers and the, the difficulties that international students have with employers. This to me is a really strong point to get across to employers, the careers market around international students are a solid. You know, they're, 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 they're good to bring into businesses. They're good to employ Why? Because they do stick and they do pass and they're, and they're doing better than domestic colleagues. So I agree with you 100%, Rob. Any reasons for that big shift? As we've discussed, it's sort of been this this trend line from the mm. early 2000s all the way through to now where international students are outperforming domestics. Any kind of major reasons for that, for that shift? Well, I, I think Alan refers to it in his paper, and it, it's a point at which I think university support services really picked up and, and some of the, the, the care around students on campus really actually, pick, I guess, picked up. That also corresponds with what might be happening with domestic students. So as we've seen over time, more and more domestic students will live or spend their lives more at home rather than on campus. So there's probably a couple of trends there that sit underneath that data flip, if you put it that way. Yeah, and maybe also a greater attention to standards in terms of admissions, yeah. bringing in students that are readier and, and high-performing students might also be a factor there too. Actually, one of the interesting things from, from that data set that I, that I thought was cute was that um, both domestic and international students, there's a big bump in the data during COVID. They actually performed better mm. by a couple of percentage points in terms of their classes. So you wonder if, you know, being locked at home with nothing to do other than study, <laughs> maybe, maybe had some upside. Negatives in terms of social interaction and social cohesion, but yep. in terms of passing subjects, it actually was helpful. Absolutely. There's nothing like boredom to fix your appetite for calculus. 
Very good. Well, Dirk, always great to be reading pieces of work from Alan Olson in the Koala News. I mean, a total industry legend. And speaking of industry legends, we've got another long-term industry legend who's just about to join us, don't we? Absolutely. Mate, it's my pleasure to uh, to introduce Jason Howard. He's a founder of the well-known company StudyLink, which has just been acquired by Flywire. And Jason is now the global head of recruitment and admissions for Flywire. So welcome, Jason. Great to have you here. Thanks, guys. Great to be here. And this is my first time podcast, funnily enough. So hopefully you're going to be gentle. Awesome. We'll be very gentle. We don't, we don't bite here. We don't bite. Mate, you've been in the industry a long time, as Rob just alluded to. You are a bit of a legend of, of the conference circuit and, and the sector more, more broadly. Before we start, just if you think back when you kicked off with StudyLink, and you know, that's probably over 20 years ago now, just give us a bit of a, a top down on what, how you've seen the, the, the sector evolve and what are some of the things that might come to mind as you, as you reflect over that time? Yeah, well, it's almost 30 years, I think. It doesn't bear thinking about really. But over that time, just so much change, I guess. But also, really looking at the more they change, the more they stay the same. So if you look at all the, the disruption we're going through now, it, you know, it's a lot of things that the sector has faced before. I mean, we've had regulatory changes. Uh, we've had financial sort of disruptions. We've had pandemics, bird flus, a lot of change. But unfortunately, it seems to be that sort of consistent theme. The one constant that's been there throughout has just been sort of the amazing people that work in the sector, legends like Alan Olson and, and, and many, many more, that are also passionate about the work that they do, what they're trying to achieve, uh, the commitment they had to helping students get a great sort of education and have a great experience. And, and I guess their resilience to sort of manage, manage sort of all those challenges and still be able to find a way to make it all work. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a good point. Well, you've probably seen a lot more than me, but I think back to, I mean, my probably biggest engagement was around the night review back in, well, I want to say, what was that, mm. a seven to nine period? Roughly a massive sweeping sweep of changes, but as a broadly as a service provider to the sector, you probably had a better view of it because you haven't necessarily been in in institution land as such, and being able to see multiple institutions move with those waves, as you say, the resilience and I guess the the being able to to navigate some of those changes just must I don't, I can't imagine it. I mean, as someone who's kind of come out of institution land now and it works more broadly across the sector, I see it with a very different lens. So I absolutely I just it's a I hear exactly what you're saying, is I guess what I'm trying to say. It's it's amazing. We're not on the front line and and I have ultimate respect for those people that are on the front line that have to be managing this the stress of sort of you know hitting targets that their institution gives them and sort of the, the often with sort of fewer resources to to be able to do it, sort of front and form strategy and, and, and make decisions to achieve those things with sort of you know, governments changing their minds, not just our own, but others as well. Yeah, just phenomenal sort of what, what they have to cope with. You know, so yeah, out of that night review, we then went into sort of all that sort of, you know, streamline the world, a genuine student or like G- GT, all of that sort of stuff, which you know has been tweaked and changed as well, sort of consistently, sort of across the time. But and everyone just rolls with it. I mean, they, they certainly would prefer to have a bit of quiet time. I, I remember, I think it's almost like you don't want to you want to be careful what you wish for because I think I remember sort of talking to people sort of about how good things were going and how like everyone was looking forward to sort of at the back end of last year and how they were looking forward to sort of a bit of you know, a bit of stability, a bit of consistency after we beat the stroke years <laughs> across and change with did it. So true. Well, so true. Yeah. But look, ultimate faith that those people that are working out will find a way because they always have. Yeah. And which which you know, which is great. And for me, I guess, yeah, like I've I've never we have great people that work work with study link that have worked in institutions and know sort of what it what it feels like to be be sort of at, at the coal face. I've not had to do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of glad because it does look like a tough game. <laughs> I was going to say, it's not fun when you're in the middle of it. You know, like you say, the, the pressure mounts from a lot of different angles. So it's, it, it can be really, really tough. Like being that close though to sort of the students that you bring in must, like that's the bit that I imagine must just make it all worthwhile, right? Because you have to walk around yeah, campus and, and sort of, you know, meet those people, talk to them and hear their stories. That's yeah. that's the bit. That For sure. I always say that the two best times of year are, are orientation and graduation because it's where you see... You know, these students that you may have met offshore at a fair or, or at a, on a college campus in the United States if they're studying abroad, and you see them come and their eyes are like dinner plates that, that first week. And, and then by the time they actually get through to graduation, you see the, the reward and the satisfaction and the accomplishment that, that comes with their journey. And as you say, you know, 
walking across campus, particularly those campuses that have quadrangles or or centres of, of meeting, you get to develop relationships with those guys and, and girls and yeah, seeing them go through that journey and then and ultimately graduate or, or finish up at the end of their their, their mobility period is something to behold. So it is, it's a sector unlike no other. And as you say, it's the people that work in it, but it's also the, the altruism, I guess, that goes alongside of it and seeing, you know, kids' lives improve and, and moving from, in a lot of cases, undergraduate students from, you know, sort of elderly adolescents, if I can put it that way, into adults by the, by the time they graduate. So you're absolutely right. It is, it is one of the, the absolute pleasures of, of being in that, in that space. Absolutely. Thank my lucky stars that I stumbled in to the sector. When we started, I said, like 1996, you know, talking to people like Dennis White and Jamie Godfrey at, at, at IDP and we were working on Fiddy ROMs yeah. and, but yeah, we, look, I had no plan. My one objective was just to not be a lawyer. <laughs> We go on, We need to dig into this now because there's a great story yeah. here for sure. I love how these international ed stories begin, which is like, oh, I never should have become an international educator, but so you were in law, were you, before you, before you ended up in, in technology? Go figure. I did a, a, um, a law degree that I was always sort of thinking that I'd sort of want to become a, a lawyer. And then I did actually work for a law firm for about six months, almost just to prove the fact that I could sort of, you know, get a job with the law firm and then it came around to my six-month review and they looked at my timesheet and what I was my billings and so well look, they look remarkably low I was like why what would he been doing I said well every time I finish an hour's work I put a one in the little box to sort of mark off what I've done they said no you've got to do that every six minutes and I was like okay that's not for me <laughs> oh. but luckily while I was doing that I'd already started some work while still at university doing some city rom project and that's what sort of we sort of grew study link from initially as a a CD-ROM sort of multimedia directory of, of... So, Jason, just just for the benefit of those people who were born after the year 2000, which is a horrifying thought, a CD-ROM. <laughs> <laughs> so funny, isn't it? It's so true. So for those of you listening at home... <laughs> yeah, amazing. You can you know, make bow bars out of them now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was just lucky that we'd sort of, you know... Well, I had an interest in technology. I was just dabbling and playing and sort of threw in various connections, met someone that had me a job sort of running a, a, a director. Well, they had a connection with Apple and we got a contract to provide some CD-ROMs for a new new computer that they were trying to sell into primary schools and secondary schools. And they just didn't have products or, or software to show off the the benefits of these these new computers. Luckily, we found a niche in that sort of study space and they, they funded the first couple of, couple of CD-ROMs we produced and we sort of built a little business around that but I guess now going back in terms of sort of what you've asked initially around the change that we've seen from it, like mm-hmm. from the service provider's perspective yeah kind of been interesting sort of walking or, or taking people hand holding them through those sort of technology changes you know CD-ROM and then the internet massive change you know taking people through sort of you know how to measure success in that starting with sort of clicks and then click throughs and then sort of you know inquiries and you know then, then some digital marketing and all that and, and you know even just think about like that, all of that change as well as I said as well well what changes but what stays the same within that sort of technology change it was still important to try and sort of make sure that users of that technology that you know through marketing and recruitment still sort of recognize that there were fundamentals to marketing and recruitment you just had technology gave you more opportunities and more options to deliver on those sort of marketing strategies that you developed it didn't really change you know about sort of price promotion and all those you know, four or five P's or whatever there are, but it just gave, you know, yeah, so people would get very excited about certain things and think that it would change everything, but really it sort of, you know, it, it gave you extra tool to sort of do what you wanted to do and, and often to do what you wanted, you needed to do more effectively or efficiently. And I guess that, Rob, you were saying earlier about sort of the tools you've been sort of been up like that are now there for podcasting, sort of, you know, still sort of fundamentally the same sort of, storytelling and and the technology just allows you to do things better and easier yeah I, I love trying to explain this sort of nexus between when when you're you're you know start as a small organization servicing very large organizations and obviously small um, startups small businesses that are working in this space you have to move fast you're always looking at what's new what's coming you know trying to adapt to get a competitive advantage in the work that you do and at the same time, you know, it's like you're, you're trying to surface these very large, slow-moving cruise ships. 
Did you ever find, and that can be really challenging. I think people who work inside large institutions might not understand that 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 different perspective. Any insights into into how to transfer that knowledge, that energy for for new technology into the sort of larger organisations? You've probably got some great war stories around it. To be honest. <laughs> we did a, a presentation, I think it was with Mark Pettit at AIEC. It was almost like the, the what, you know, Fight Club, what, what, <laughs> what goes on in Fight Club stays in Fight Club. And so we just sort of say, now from a supplier and a, and a client sort of point of view, what are the war stories and, you know, how, and it was a great session because it, it did, like, there are things on both sides that, you know, suppliers get frustrated with. Why can't these universities and colleges move quicker? And then, and then you sort of talk to the university and college. And a lot of those things happen for a reason as well. And it's about understanding that, understanding sort of why, why universities do what they do around governance and compliance and, and sort of all the different stakeholders that, that exist and, and, and not letting that frustrate you in terms of and and put it yeah, then recognizing as a supplier you've got to put in a lot of work across many different stakeholders to make sure they're all aware of what you do and why you do it and what benefits it's going to deliver for their organization even if they're not the decision maker they're an influencer in that so now we've we've always sort of approached what we do with our clients as a relationship and i think that's key to it it's like it's about building that relationship and you're having many many different conversations all the time not all of them are going to lead to, to business, but they will give you a greater understanding of what your clients are going through or your prospects are going through. Great, great insights into sort of what you can be doing to help sort of develop your product to sort of solve their problems, but also just, you know, letting the the institution know you're listening and you're wanting to be there. So it, it's, yeah, there's no, no, no quick answer, easy answer to that one, unfortunately, but, but it can be frustrating. And there probably are some clients listening that no, if I do say that we have some, we've got some interesting stories and they'd probably be a few nervous people out there going, oh, I don't, maybe he's not going to <laughs> It does absolutely go both ways. I had James Martin on the podcast from Insider Guides a month or so back ago and we're sort of reflecting on the same, same question. It's just a really interesting dynamic and it's actually quite a privilege, I find, to be external to these really large, important organisations and to be able to influence them and to support them on their journey towards new technology, new approaches and what have you. But to also be those that, that that kind of horizon scanner, if you like, like example. Now being in a larger organisation ourselves, you're always told as a small business, oh, you're so lucky, you're nimble, you can do whatever you like, and you always got, you always got, yeah, yeah, but I'm doing it on a smell of an oily rag, <laughs> and, um, and there's always other things that I've got to deal with that, like because now within a larger organisation, I see it from that other side of, you know, again now having to deal with those sort of internal processes and governance and approval and sign-offs, and again recognising and seeing that there's reasons for all of that. There is a role for those sort of smaller external organisations to provide that sort of innovation for these larger organisations, as long as you can get that relationship right. You mentioned obviously uh, you've just been acquired by Flywire. Before we get into that, because I'm really interested in how that came about and your experience thus far, and you've just touched on it. Can you give the listeners just a, a, a quick elevator pitch as to the StudyLink front-end system and then maybe go into a little bit about the evolution of it from CD-ROM catalogs to today? Because I think that that journey in itself is just is, is a really, really fascinating one. I guess what we provide today is a solution that helps institutions manage their application and admissions process, particularly from their agent channel we offer two versions of, of our product one is what we call capture which is sits on the front end of an existing uh, system you might want to keep using for your assessment and issuing offers but we act as that sort of front end for the agents and direct applicants to receive sort of or to deliver the application then receive status updates and you know, take actions around sort of the the offer and acceptance and payment and all of those sorts of things and then the second solution we have is admit which is a fully featured admissions solution that does also the assessment and initially offer so i'm providing that choice yeah interesting journey in terms of how we got there so as i said started with that big that, journey eh? that's massive from, from cd roms to that it's amazing yeah and look it has taken a long time because we've done it with very little, I guess, funding, but it's also interesting to see that, Rob, I guess to your point, around that pace of change that an institution can cope with, we've sort of grown at the pace that institutions can adopt what we develop. are always pushing a bit harder than maybe what our institutions are, are, are able to, to do. From CD-ROM, we moved to the internet. So that CD-ROM sort of 
business model was like a directory business model. The internet made that easier to distribute and get to a wider audience. So we had a search engine. We'd sell advertising to institutions to help promote them and generate those initial leads. In in about 2006, we realized that we we had these leads and maybe we could sort of do some conversion with them online and, and turn them into an applicant. And so we signed up a few institutions to an, as an agent. So we became an online agent. And I say we, but there were some key people in that, like that are now sort of also key people in the sector now, like people like Rishan Schechner and, and Jonathan Pratt. We had, like, we've got, again, so the whole journey, like, like, I'll talk about the people that are working in the sector. There's been amazing people working in Studylink as well. And so I'll just tell the story, I'll just, they, they spring to mind. But they really developed this amazing counseling process online that helped us con- convert the, these, these inquirers into, into applicants. But what we found was that they, those people were also looking for like that face to face. So they would often take our advice um, and then go and work with the, their local agent to, to, to complete the deal. And back in 2006, agents didn't see a value in the online channel. So we tried to talk to agents about, oh, look, can we be like your referral partner? So, you know, it you know, didn't, didn't quite work. But what we did discover was it's really hard as an agent to work with multiple institutions. And there's a real cost to that in terms of um, the time taken to manage that administration across multiple institutions and the time that takes away from what you're able to do with the app. So we wanted to try and sort of fix or, or help that in some way. And we developed this single portal for agents to submit and manage to many providers. So the idea being if you gave agents one place to go that you know, was consistent for the agent, but still allowed the institutions to customize the application form and their workflows so they didn't have to change anything. It would sort of make, make like, you'd take away a lot of that, that sort of pain and help the agents then focus on the app. So we launched that in about 2010. And then when we started to talk to institutions, that was at the time of that, that sort of whole GTE change. And what they were finding is that all those changes that they were having to make to their internal admissions process to to do gender and temporary entrance test and the, all the ERP systems, the people softs and the, the the tech ones weren't nimble enough to make the changes to their system. So their their issue was their back end. I they, remember they, these they, days they really well. Any flashbacks? You know? yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Put in a ticket and you might wait 18 months to get to the top of yeah, it. Yeah. So they were saying that's the problem we need need fixing. So we, we then sort of more amazingly like, like Emma Buck Choi that came and joined us and started to develop that sort of, that, that's our software to be that fully featured admission solution to almost get people to use our front end agent portal. But now what we've got is the, as I said, this these use now most of our, our clients in Australia use that admit product, that fully featured admit solution. But what it means is that agents really for the Australian market, particularly given the number of university clients we have, have almost a single point to go to to manage all the applications across all their clients in a very easy and efficient way. So they can be spending more time working on the applicant. And we've delivered sort of even greater or, or more features for agents to be able to sort of get more efficiency out of that with APIs into those agent systems so that you know, big agents like IDP have their own sort of CRM systems and, and you know, so we'd remove the, the need for them to copy and paste data from those systems into into ours to run the application. There's now seamless flow of data from where the agent is collecting that from the applicant and needing to pass it through to admissions and flowing backwards and forwards through the process. Jason, you're really showing my age right now because uh, I remember getting PDF applications through and having a team of data processors put them into the system themselves. And I remember thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful to have someone else offshore be able to digitize all that information so we actually don't have to look at those PDF documents, print them out, actually put them in piles and then put them into another system. It's incredible. Oh, yeah. And look, you talk about PDFs and paper. Like, again, it's amazing. Like, some of the changes in the journey, like one of one of our clients, the amount of space that they saved when they when we were able to roll out study link and they didn't have to have paper, it took away all these filing cabinets. Like, and that was a massive matter of room taken up by filing cabinets. Yeah, do you remember the old compactors? <laughs> it's incredible. We had, we had a whole yeah a whole compactor go. Yeah, it's amazing. So, yeah, then you got more office space and yeah. <laughs> the thing, the thing I love about this story, and Absolutely. I think it's I think it's a. It's indicative of good a, a good business. And when as you've been talking there, Jason, the thing I've heard a lot is like, there was this we found this problem and we wanted to solve the problem. And I think people maybe who haven't been in the sort of entrepreneurial space might think that 
you know, running a business starts by having an idea. And, and I really think the best businesses are those that, that are just obsessed about a problem. Like I found this problem and I'm going to solve this problem because you, you know, there may be many different iterations you have to go through in order to solve the problem. But as long as you're really hope honed in on that, you'll always, there's a business to be made there. Whereas an idea about something is, is just an idea that may or may not work. So it's, it's very interesting. You know, you've identified like all these problems as you've gone, gone along. So I, I, love, I love listening to that, hearing you about that kind of mindset. Yeah, the, the problem solving mindset. Yeah, Rob, I, I, I love the development over time because as Jason mentioned, there's things that worked and there are things that weren't that didn't work. And businesses can morph and and be fluid in a way to move on to the next problem. Like you say, starting off with CD-ROM catalogs to having full-blown admission systems is a chasm that you could never jump if you didn't follow that journey. So it's it's yeah, it's an amazing story. Which probably brings us to What's happened this year and the acquisition by Fire by Flower, Jason? Just tell us a little bit about how that came about and 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 where you're at now. Well, it happened very quickly when it did happen, but it had been part of a not a journey, but we we sort of we'd been working with Flyway for a, a number of years because they're a supplier of the one of the the payment options in our accept and pay process within StudyLink. So when someone accepts a, an offer within StudyLink, we sort of you know, do this pass and hand over to. Um, the payment platform to, to to take the deposit and Flywire was was one of those options. So we sort of worked with their product and and their team for for quite a while. Um, and we're always always impressed by they had the best solution and the best software. They've got a great vision around software driving payments. So it wasn't just about sort of the FX and sort of the trade that that it, it was actually sort of trying again and uh, Rob to your point they had, they saw a problem and they're trying to solve solve that problem um, and the people that we met also um, regularly at conferences and things like that or dealt with in terms of um, delivering it, the solution together um, were great you know, there was a good fit um, between their team and, 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 and our team I felt so came to us I guess in about October last year and, and said that they were interested uh, in having that discussion it was something that we were already, already thinking that might might have been sort of on the card, so we're we're excited, and it was just good timing, I guess. So Navitas as well, it had been our major shareholder, a very good shareholder all, all the way through. I mean, well, since actually they started from two thousand and six, very supportive, very patient, but also it's a good time for them, I think, to sort of pass the business on to another organisation that could sort of help with its next next stage of growth. So yeah, the, the timing was was just good. Yeah, awesome. So if you look at your crystal ball. What's your without giving away anything commercially confidence? What does the what does the development Dirk, we like scoop. Do, the development? Dirk, Dirk, you're an absolutely. We, we love a we scoop. Love, we love a scoop. scoop, Jason. Well, well, I'm absolutely. Really careful about what I say now because you know there's this thing so they have to to get roadmap signed off. Um, <laughs> you can be as coy as you like, mate. You can be as coy as you like. No, look, there's already been a, a number of things we've we've done in the, in this first sort of five months since. If the deal happens. So as I said, our products were already working together, but we've developed and, and they're already delivered improvements to that. So they work even better together now. So there's a, an even more seamless sort of flow between those those two solutions. So from an agent's point of view, particularly that might be using StudyLink for admissions and Flywi for payments, the two just exchange data together better than they did before, making that an even easier process for the agents to manage. That's been sort of the first the first thing we're, we've done. Some of the things we're, like I'm really interested in, I guess, and excited about the potential with Flywire is they've got great experience around fraud and, and money laundering from a financial perspective. And I think there's a, a real opportunity to, to use that experience and translate that to document fraud. So that comes sort of with a combination of technology, which, which they have, and process, and then sort of a, a governance structure as well. So I think there's sort of an option they're keen to explore with current customers and people within Flywire and agents to see sort of how we can add value to the sector using that 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 knowledge and, and skill set. I think it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity that we um I think that is there because of the strengths of the two the two groups. Yeah, that um, makes a lot of sense. And and then also like using that in terms of the the knowledge that Flyway also has around that payment process and the assistance they also give to students with their payment ongoing payments is managing that ability to pay and that question in the admissions process around okay this is someone that really wants to come they're a great candidate 
Now, do they tick that box in sort of also being able to afford it? And, and that's another area I think that together we'll be able to deliver a, a great solution for the sector in time. <laughs> but there are, I guess, two immediate sort of things in my mind that I see there's great opportunity um, around around the, the, the combination. And then there's all that. It's a whole bunch of other stuff. Like we've got immediate benefits um, from the higher security profile that Flywire has as an organization being a payments business. So that's that's benefited our, our current customers already in terms of that that protection we can give to their, their their personal data. There's a lot of that data that we do have that we've always been keen to try and see what what value we can provide in terms of insight. And Flywire has a team of, of data analysts. We had sort of one person that that was maybe a tenth of their role. <laughs> And we were always yeah. struggling to try and sort of, you know, make, get, get some value out of that for our, our clients. So there's real opportunity there as well to sort of get some great insights into that data now. And I've already played around with sort of being able to, to sort of put out the, the sort of um, likelihood of an agent to, to convert applications. So, you know, predictive sort of, you now some predictive analytics as well, yeah. you know, getting into that sort of agent quality sort of question too for, from particular countries for, for, for particular for programs for particular types of institutions. So, you know, not saying that there's just quality is sort of one, lots of exciting things to look at. <laughs> Mate, it sounds like you're going to be busy. I don't think we mentioned earlier, but you're off on a holiday shortly, going to Europe for a few weeks. Enjoy that, but you're going to be busy when you get back, mate. Oh, I will. And as I was saying, I'm looking forward to it because it's the first holiday I'm going away with where I don't have to sort of think about doing payroll or or, or, or answering any of those other sorts of questions. That's one of the, the real benefits personally <laughs> from the, you know, this is like, you know, hopefully, yeah, I'll be able to switch off a little bit on this one. I'm definitely looking forward to it. <laughs> I have a confession to make that, uh, I mean, you talked about James Martin um, earlier. So I did actually confuse him for you, Rob at API. Um, and I think that's good for both of you in a couple of ways when I was thinking about it. It's like, it's a bit embarrassing for me because, you know, I, sh I should have, you know, picked that up, but it was, I was at like four week travel and I was tired and there was a lot of people and stuff and noise going on. But I guess for, for James to be, for me to think that he, he was sort of, I thought he was legendary enough to be in your, your sphere, <laughs> even though he's, he's still a legend. <laughs> And for you to think that I thought that you were as, as young as look, look <laughs> yes, yeah. but I'm sure like, have you ever put it to the photo of you two together? Love it. I think we, we do have, do look a little bit similar. Somebody made the comment because when I published the podcast yeah. episode, oh, the sure. thumbnail, someone said, oh, he looks a bit like you, Rob. So yeah, easy mistake to make. So that's, that's, there we go. The truth is out. That's the real reason I wear a Nakura hat everywhere is not to be confused <laughs> with, the, with the great uh, James Martin. Well, I love it. Like you're both storytellers too, right? So there's that. Yeah, we love the stories. It was, it was actually, it's a fantastic episode if people want to go and go back and listen to that. James, a really good storyteller and, and some really interesting, actionable insights, just things you can do in your day, whether it's a LinkedIn post, whether it's trying to get buy-in for a project internally in your institution, or of course, in marketing, some really actionable tips and advice in that episode. It was a good one. And guys, I don't know whether you know this, but it was actually a dinner with James that sparked the the idea of putting the koala together. So it was the, the two of us in Northbridge in Perth having having a Thai meal and it was just as Campus Morning Mail was wrapping up and he just looked at me across the table and said, why don't you do it yourself? So the guy is, is an ideas man and, and a great motivator too. Yeah, wonderful person. Well, Jason, a great pleasure having you on the Global Horizons podcast. Thanks for making time to join us and have an extremely rewarding, relaxing trip to Europe. Thanks, guys. Looking forward to it. And uh, yeah, love your work and look forward to the, the next uh, edition of Koala News and and, and and your journey too, Rob. Appreciate that. And for those of you listening at home, of course, thekoalanews.com is your source of all the latest international education news that keeps you going throughout the week, throughout the months. Dirk, as always, fantastic to chat. Man, I'll see you in a couple of weeks' time. Take care. Yeah, great chat. Thanks again, Jason. Look forward to it. Right, Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Take care. Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.